Marie, the preeminent person in our midst here today, and then that you lead us is what we're asking for. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for standing this morning. Please be seated. Three hundred and eight is our next hymn. Three oh eight, higher ground. Well, welcome everyone. 
so glad that you braved the harsh conditions and made it here to church this morning. And how many of y'all own umbrellas? Any of you have umbrellas? Good. How many of y'all carry umbrellas? Well, look, Angela's got one right there. Way to go. Nicely done. I've got an umbrella in my car, but it's never worth pulling that thing out and putting it back up. You just take it, you know, it, uh, it's not freezing rain, and we'll be all right. No. But it's incredible uh, how soft Floridians are when it comes <laughs> to weather. I've told you guys a story just a couple of weeks ago, but when I first, in 2000, uh, when I first was in South Florida, which is very different from the rest of Florida as far as the winter weather goes, I remember we got down into the 50s one Sunday morning and Pastor McClure, uh, told me, he said, you know, he said, we're going to be down in our attendance here this morning. And I said, why? I, said, I thought maybe it was a holiday or something. He's like, because of the cold weather. It was just crisp. It was just beautiful. Uh, just really nice. He said, because of the weather. And what was really funny in Delray Beach, most of our church people were from New York. You know, <laughs> that's where they were all from. And uh, sure enough, we're probably about 50% attendance that morning because of the 50 degree weather and you know I ask people hey I missed you yesterday were you sick or something no it's just too cold to go out I didn't want to get sick and, and uh, anyway <laughs> I found it to be very true of South Florida so if you're new here and you don't know about this phenomenon which is that Floridians can bravely endure a hurricane uh, outdoors but they can't uh, come to church when the temperature is under you know, 70 degrees. Uh, <laughs> well, I have nothing to tell you. Let me mention a couple things. First of all, uh, welcome to our visitors. Good to have our friends from Kentucky visiting with us today. And by the way, you need to move here to replace our folks that moved to Kentucky. It's not fair what Kentucky has done for us. We've lost too many to Kentucky. And honestly, our weather is better. It really is. So uh, we love, we're really glad that you guys came today. And we hope that you feel as welcome as we are delighted to have you. We do pray for visitors. And when you come, you're an answer to our prayer. And so thank you so much for being that representative of God's goodness to us here today. I want to just mention a couple of things by way of announcement. Uh, we're, it's the beginning of the month this month, and so men, you'll want to pay special attention to this because we have moved men's prayer time back to where it should have been. Uh, okay. and, uh, and by the way, with that, we didn't do it without pulling the audience. Lee put a poll in the Facebook group. Uh, the men's prayer Facebook group on, and uh, he asked when do you want men's prayer to be I voted for Friday morning at 6 30 a.m. and uh, that's when everybody else voted for and so that's convenient for me and we did change it some years ago because of our Millennials we had a large millennial <laughs> constituency. That, I, this, I'm not joking we really did this uh, isn't that why we changed it Lee yeah. used to be that and uh, a couple times the Millennials came uh, <laughs> But, but, you know, we, we just, you know, us old folks, we can't be awake after at 7.30 at night. So we moved it back to 6.30 a.m. And, uh, I mean, we're already four hours into our day at that time because, you know, when you get over 40, you can't sleep past about 3 or 4 a.m. anyway. So we're going to pray in the morning, man. This Friday is our first one, Friday the 1st, and uh, that will be at 6.30 a.m. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, birthday people. It's Shamir's birthday today, and he's 19 years old. God bless you, Shamir. Uh, happy birthday to you. And Chuck is turning 80 this year, finally finally getting 80, and that'll be on uh, uh, Saturday, no, let's see, Friday, Friday, men's prayer. You come pray with us on your 80th birthday at 6.30 a.m. Chuck. Chuck will wear his pajamas if he shows up at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> I've seen him before 10 a.m. before, and it's always pajamas. <laughs> Unless it's after that. Uh, God bless you, Chuck. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to both of, of you. I hope you have a great week. Hey, teenagers, it's this Saturday, and it is Day of Champions. We're going to Land of Lakes, Florida. The Bill Rice Ranch is hosting the Day of Champions, so it's like Thursday. If you've been to the Bill Rice Ranch, it's like the Thursday competition, uh, and it's all on one day, and that's going to be Saturday. We're leaving at 5 a.m. Somebody put it this way last week. Uh, at 5 a.m., that means you'll see taillights. That does not mean we're assembling and getting ready to leave. That means at 5 a.m. And if you come at 5.05, you won't see anything because we'll already be on I-95. So uh, 5 a.m., it's important and that you be on time. We've got a good group of teens going. I think we have 15 or 16 teenagers and three adults that are going to be going on that group. So pray for our traveling safety. That'll be uh, eight hours of driving on Saturday over at, well, yeah, about eight hours over to... Land of Lakes and, and back in the evening and uh, pray that that will be a great time. We're going to have some great preaching 
and uh, some sports competition and some goofy competition. There's inflatable jousting and bungee run and all those things. So we're going to have a great time. Teenagers, if you want to invite a friend, uh, make sure to get one of the permission forms from me and make sure to get it filled out and back. And so that's all you need to know about that this week. And then this month we have several things that are up and coming. The Rices are going to be with us on February the 17th all day. That will be Will Rice and Dr. Bill Rice and their families uh, will be with us uh, preaching on the 17th. Is it the 10th? No, it's the 17th. We put a, did you make a mistake? I'm seeing 10th on, on uh, the bulletin here. It's on the 17th, though, is what it's supposed to be. Somebody made a mistake. There's an error here. Huh? That is me. Okay. All right. I want everybody to know that Lee is fallible. <laughs> and there's a mistake in the bulletin. It's the 17th, not the 10th. But Luke, you corrected it, didn't you? You're the one that drew this up. Who drew on my bulletin here to fix this here? Probably Luke. Somebody. Who did? Oh, Angela did. All right. So I let everybody let it be known that Angela knows that <laughs> Lee is fallible. <laughs> Uh, our last soul winning saturation training will be on this coming up Saturday, or not this Saturday, but two Saturdays from now. And if you were not able to be here at the beginning last night with the soul winning scenarios, if you'd like to ask me questions personally, I don't feel like, oh, it has to be a group of us meeting, but if you have a question about reaching a friend, coworker, uh, neighbor, family member, and so forth, feel free to do that. And we could go over that as well. That's not a one-time thing where now we're not going to talk about winning your winning your friends, family, neighbors anymore because you didn't make it last night uh, in time for that. So, uh, chili cook-off, February 23rd. We'll say more about that when the time comes. But that's it for announcements this morning. So if I can get you gentlemen to come up here and help with taking up the offering this morning, we would ask our visitors if you would slip uh, your your uh, visitor part of your bulletin if you tear that off and slip it in the offering plate when it comes by so we can have a record of your visit. That's all we ask from our visitors in the bulletin. And so let's pray now and let's ask God to bless our giving this morning. And Charlie, would you pray, please pray for that? Sure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you just for this opportunity to be able to worship you in giving. I pray, Father, now as we give, Lord, that you would bless, uh, we'd be able to see much more done. Uh, to be able to reach Fort Lauderdale, Broward County, and the world for you with what comes in. I pray, Father, also as well that you'd have free reign in our hearts today. And Lord, I pray that the heart's needs would be met. And if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, that uh, you'd bring understanding, conviction, Lord, and that you cry out for you uh, this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of Grace Greater Than Our Sin, 209. Settled 
If you need a better seat, there are some that have been recently vacated, which you can come have, so feel free. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so feel free to bail yourself. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm going to read this morning just a couple of verses, uh, four verses specifically, beginning in verse 15. And uh, so let's go ahead and look there in your copy of the Scripture this morning. If you need a Bible, there are many available in the room. If you don't have one uh, with you, make sure that you get a copy of the Scripture because you need to know this from the Word of God. So, Louis, did he just take your Bible from you? Well, um, they didn't have the Oh, it doesn't? Somebody, somebody stole John from that Bible? <laughs> there you go. All right. Make sure everybody has a copy of the Scripture. John chapter 1, and we'll look down to verse... 15. We're introduced to John, and yes. in the next couple of weeks we will be uh, we'll be looking at, at who John is, uh, John the Baptist is, but that's who we're referencing in verse 15. John bear witness of him, and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, because he was before me. And of his fullness have all that we received in grace for grace. For law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared of Him. Now I want to read verses 17 and 18 because that's where we'll spend a majority of our time this morning. So let's read those two verses again. For law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Well, we'll pray this morning. God, we do need Your help this morning. and We need help not only with alertness, but desire. God, help us to desire to not only know Your Word, but to know the Christ that's revealed in this Word. And then God, help us with our understanding this morning as well. And I pray that the simplicity of the truth in this gospel, which is written so that we could believe that Jesus is the Christ, would be something that does not escape us. God, help us in, in, in areas, ways in our minds, maybe that would be because of pride. Help us to become simple who are able to be wise because of understanding simple truth. And I just thank you for what you'll do now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Last week we began began our series in the Gospel of John, and I want to just uh, remind you about a few things as well as some practical things as well. This would be a good opportunity for you, especially the next several weeks, to invite individuals that you know that have questions about who Jesus is. The Gospel of John is unrivaled in winning lost people to Jesus Christ. I do not know personally how many people uh, that I even know who have told me I got saved when I read the Gospel of John. By the time I finished reading the Gospel of John, I knew that Jesus was God. I knew how simple salvation was. And a lot of them will tell me I got saved in the first five chapters of the Gospel of John. And so this is a, this is a portion of the Scripture that, friend, you ought to convince people to read, to analyze, and to study. It is just so powerful and so practical. And uh, the, uh, so it's a good opportunity for you to invite people to come and to hear the preaching of the Word of God. And I'll be honest with you, uh, John's not really an offensive gospel. You know, there are some things that you preach and teach in the Word of God, and you almost wish that people before they're saved wouldn't hear those things preached. Now, we don't hide truth from people. But John isn't one of those. Uh, you know, the word love is used more in John than anywhere else. Now, I'm not one of these people that say, God is only love. No, not at all. But my friend, God is love. And God loves so much that comprehending His love is something that if you were to study it for your entire life, and you were to strive to grasp and understand the love of God, you would you'd never, as much as you understood about God, the only thing you could understand about God is love. It is more infinite and more vast than you can comprehend. God is very love. And that's reality. I love the, the old song. It's not that old, but the song, The Love of God. And uh, the, the, the things that are in it, because it just really speaks in my heart when I've realized, when I've come to know God's love. And my, my conclusion, every time I see something or I, 
I understand just a little bit more about how much God loves me is that God loves me more than I can understand. And that's incredible. How do you understand a God-loving, ungodly people? You know, that's, that's a virtue that only a believer can have, honestly. You know, the people who are wicked in this world, it's tough to love them, isn't it? I've had people tell me, Pastor, I have a hard time loving people that do. And they'll tell me something that people do. They say, I have a hard time loving them. You know, God just does it because it's His character. If I love somebody, it'll be unnatural for me. But God just does. And it's, that's, that's who He is. And so when you become like Him, as you uh, grow to be like Jesus Christ, it becomes uh, something that's unnatural for you. And so as loving as you may be, it's not natural for you, but it's natural for God. That's a great thing about the Gospel of John. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to understand and know some things. Last week we looked at a couple of verses toward the end of the Gospel of John. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read them so I don't misquote them. I should probably brush up on my memorization. But in uh, John chapter 20, he gave his purpose statement about why he wrote the gospel. this Gospel. He said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. You want to help someone believe that Jesus is the Christ? This Gospel will help with it. Read the Gospel of John. Read the things that Jesus did. I appreciated what Charlie said this morning, or what maybe it was one of the guys, the guy on the video said, uh, his brother Wood, in behalf of Charlie, and uh, that is that the birth of Jesus Christ is indisputable. So when he was an atheist, uh, and he wanted to argue with a friend about the person of Jesus, and now I'm, I'm misquoting, missummarizing, but this is true for a lot of people, he realized, yes, Jesus did exist. Yes, Jesus was crucified on the cross. Those who were opposed to Jesus reported it. And uh, yes, Jesus is the Son of God because of the miracles that He did that proved He was God. All right, and now then we'll go to chapter, uh, or you don't have to go to chapter 20. I'm going to read chapter 21 and read the, one more verse about the Gospel of John. Verse 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. That song, The Love of God, I believe that one of the verses comes from this. You know, it talks about if if the sky were a scroll and the oceans were ink, that the, the to write the love of God uh, would drain the oceans dry. And I believe that that is a reference by the songwriter to John and the last couple of verses in that gospel. And uh, that's really the fact of the truth of the matter is that the things that Jesus did were so vast and so uh, con so finally proved and concluded that He was Christ, that there's just no debating it to any open-minded, honest person. So this is a helpful study, and I hope that our, that this is a reminder to you about that. Uh, I, man, you folks, you're tired this morning. I'm going to try to wake you up real quick. We're going to do some jumping jacks, so everybody jump. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, try to wake up. Try to wake up real quick. Because it's important to, to just remember some of these thematic elements. And I'm sorry I mention them each time that we're in the, in this portion of the Scripture. But it is really, really vital for us because we want to understand what we're studying within its context. And so, understand the Gospel of John is unique from the other Gospels. The seven miracles that are in the Gospel of John are dramatic. They are major and they resoundingly... John you know, kind of narrows down the miracles that he shares that prove who Jesus is. And the reason he does that is because he wants us to know only God could have done this, and Jesus is God. And so it's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow the same, this is who Jesus is, flow of thought. Jesus is the Gospel. But when John gives his Gospel, he wants us to not only understand who Jesus is, he wants us to believe in Jesus. And so when you preach the Gospel, my friend, where you are convincing individuals to trust, to believe in Jesus, to receive Him as their Savior, it follows naturally that the Gospel of John is that Gospel that you preach from. Now, I can preach the Gospel from any verse in the Bible. I can take any verse in the Bible and I can preach the Gospel from it. But John is the place where Jesus says, this is how you can know. 
This is the gospel. So John chapter 3. Hey believers, you want to do something that will enrich your life in a way that perhaps never has before been? If you've never memorized John chapter 3, memorize it in the next couple of months while we're in this gospel and it'll change your life. And it'll change and simplify your understanding of the simplicity of the gospel so that you can just present it to people like you never have before. Hey, take me up on that challenge. If you do, I'll take you for a steak dinner. Or I'll make you a steak. I'll do it cheap, but I'll do it. Okay? <laughs> but if you memorize the Gospel of, of John, chapter 3, you can quote it to me, and you haven't done it before, I'll take you out for a steak dinner or for some tofu or something. Uh, <laughs> whatever your preference is, I'm all things to all men. And I'll watch you eat tofu, even if it kills me. All right, John chapter uh, 1 <laughs> and verse 15. Oh, I wanted to mention a couple of other things uh, before we get, get into our text this morning. The word life is mentioned 36 times in the Gospel of John. The word life is mentioned 36 times in the Gospel of John. It's about living. It's about having life. It's about knowing that you have eternal life. And so these are some important uh, thematic elements. Uh, and so I, I don't want to, if you want to go back and kind of get introduced, if you missed last week's message, uh, it should be up on YouTube sometime soon. I don't know where Tony is, but he can give you that information and and uh, help, you, help you to know where that's at so that you can follow along and... and have every part of the messages. Okay, John chapter 1, verse 15. We're introduced to a different John than the writer. This is John the Baptist, or as uh, cool people call him, J.T. Baptist. Okay, there's a famous singer by the name of J.T. Baptist. Just I'm just making jokes. If you know what the joke is, that's fine. If you don't, you're not missing anything. All right, but in, in, this is John, and this is, of course, the individual that we're told was going to be the fourth teller or the one who prepares the way of the Lord, the one that makes his path straight. John is, of course, we will look in the next couple of weeks at who John the Baptist is, and it's a real help because I'll tell you something, if you want to find someone in the New Testament and emulate their attitude for living for Jesus, John the Baptist is the guy. You know, not to give a spoiler, but the servant is not greater than his master. And he must increase, but I must decrease. That's John. The guy that understands that God's purpose for my life is greater than my uh, being great in the eyes of men. And John really will help you if you struggle with knowing what greatness is in a right perspective. Sometimes by pretense of humility, we struggle with greatness. We think, well, you know what, I shouldn't be great because only Jesus Christ is supposed to be lifted up. Well, there's greatness in the eyes of men and there's greatness in the eyes of God. And John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived. And he's a good model for greatness. We'll see that in a couple of weeks uh, but from a human example. But John is saying here in verse 15, I'm not about myself, I'm about Jesus. He that is cometh after me, excuse me, is preferred before me. Last week we, we saw that Jesus Christ was eternal God. We saw that He's the incarnate Word of God. We saw that He was God in the flesh. And John here alludes to the same thing, that, or John the Baptist alludes to the same thing that the Apostle John refers to, and that is that he that is after me is preferred before me because he was before me. In other words, he's saying Jesus didn't begin when he was born of a virgin. Jesus was God who came in the form of human flesh as a child, as a babe. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost, but Jesus did not begin at his birth. Jesus was present with God in creation. We saw that last week in Proverbs in chapter 30. Uh, we saw that last week in Genesis chapter 1, and that Jesus is God. And so we saw the doctrine of the Godhead here, and that's what this is what John the Baptist is referring to. Jesus is not a prophet. Jesus is not a great man. Jesus was God. And even when they would speak of Him as a prophet, my friend, Jesus was not a prophet. Jesus is God. And when He spoke, He spoke the words of God, and He Himself was the Word of God. And there are a lot of doctrinal implications, and we brushed on those, or touched on those last week. But I want to look at verse 16 as well, and just give you uh, just a, another thing. And that's not the message this morning. We're not preaching. I want to preach verses 17 and 18. And, uh, but I want to <clears throat> touch on something just, just briefly. Uh, in verse 16, with the scriptures of His fullness, have we all received, and grace for grace. Could I encourage you, another study, uh, just memorize John 3, but another study that will enrich and change your life is to understand the doctrine of grace. And by that, I'm not saying what the Calvinists have recently uh, 
uh, renamed their Catholicism as, which is the doctrines of John Calvin. But what I'm talking about with the grace here is what the Bible teaches about grace. There are 150 different words in the Bible, or different verses, 170 different uh, times the word grace is used. And if you want to understand what grace is by definition, we have a lot of things like acrostics, you know, God's riches at uh, Christ's expense. But it's just God's goodness. It's just God's undeserved goodness. And if you'll study it, in particular in the Old Testament, you'll get a good established foundation of what grace is. And you will also establish that God has always been gracious. You know, sometimes we call the church age the age of grace. And I don't object to that. I don't have a problem with it. Unless we are contrasting it and saying that God has not always been gracious. And friend, God has always been gracious. It is part of His character. And if you want to know God, know His love. But you want to know God, know His grace as well. And it will, it will enrich and it will change your life. Put it in its context when you study grace. Just like studying repentance in the Scripture. When you study a word and then you make it have a singular context. Anthony, you gotta, you got to get it together. You're distracting me, okay? All right. So just like in its context uh, where repentance, you know, a lot of people study repentance and they create a doctrine from the word instead of understanding the word from the doctrine or understanding the word from its context. And so everybody believes repentance is in the context of salvation, which entirely eradicates it from a believer's life. If you only have to repent in order to be saved, then what is repentance for a believer? And that's why the, the uh, married false doctrine uh, with the, the wrong teaching of repentance is lordship salvation. It's because a lot of people say, well, you know, if you sin, then you evidently didn't repent. And if you didn't repent, uh, then Jesus isn't Lord of your life. And so this is how we know that you're not actually saved. It never helps you as a believer to get victory over sin and instead uh, causes you to assign blame to God for not saving you well enough in the first place that you no longer sin. And uh, 1 John helps with that. Fellowship's the problem in that context of repentance. Grace is another word that if you put in a singular context, you will eliminate its, its scope of teaching. And not only that, but you'll come up with false doctrine about it as well. And so study grace in its context. I'm not going to preach through it. I have in the past done a series. I think I did a five-week series one time on, on grace uh, for Sunday school some years back, and maybe that would be a good thing to do again. But please, believer, study, study what grace is, and don't study it by starting to read somebody's book and get their take on it mm -hmm. and decide whether or not you agree with them or not. Study it in the Word of God and take every verse and, every, and read the context around the verse and then write a summary statement for what grace is in every verse. And I'm telling you, it'll change your life. It'll enrich your understanding of God and you'll, have a, uh, you'll, you'll know Him more as a result of it. Okay? Now, that's all I'm going to give you from chapter uh, 1, verse 16. Now, I want to look at a couple of things in uh, verse 17. I want to talk about uh, the, the really verse, or verse 17 and verse 18 as key or theme, thematic elements in the Gospel of John. Verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And I just want to look at John's introduction as he's going to help believers understand what they need to know in order to believe. I want us to understand that John contrasts the purpose of the law and the purpose of grace and truth. And by the way, the way that grace and truth is used in this context is not completely synonymous, but complementary. You understand what I mean by that? In other words, grace is not the same word as truth, but grace is truth. Um, truth is not the same as, as grace, but grace uh, helps us to understand what truth is. In other words, He is giving us an understanding that is a contrast of the law, and that is that God's grace... Uh, is what saves us. It's that aspect that's salvific uh, yeah, about grace. And I hope I'm not confusing you uh, with words. Salvific's a made-up word that some seminary professor came up with some years ago. And so I don't know who, who made it up, but uh, it's probably an actual word now, but it's a made-up word that means having to do with salvation, okay? But I've read it in books, and so I know it's a real word because somebody uh, else used it improperly before me. All right, uh, <laughs> verse... Uh, let, let's, let's just look at a couple of things in the Scripture. There, again, this would be a good study for you along with, with grace. But I want to look at the contrast between the law and grace. If you go with me to Galatians 
in chapter 4. If you were to study, uh, study the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, then you would see a good synopsis uh, of what grace actually is. I've got to find Galatians in my Bible. There we go. Um, Galatians. We're going to go to chapter 4. I actually want to read beginning, I believe, in uh, verse 19. You've got to get it together. Sober up, okay? Seriously, you, you distracted me about 10 times. I'm about to get aggravated. All right. Chapter 4, verse 19. Okay. Um. No, chapter 3 and verse 19. All right, wherefore then serveth the law? Okay, now John said in, in, that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So wherefore then serveth the law? The question is, what does purpose does the law serve? What's the purpose of the law? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Well, the Bible says it was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed of promise? Jesus is. Okay? Who was the promise made to? Well, that would be Israel. The law given to Israel. And again, I wish I had time to preach about the law this morning, and I cannot uh, because of time. But the Bible says it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law therefore against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Now there is a group of individuals, and there always are, but there's a group of individuals that are especially prolific on the internet right now that really preach a lot of the Bible. They don't very often preach, I've noticed, from the New Testament. They preach from the Old Testament because of their replacement theology. But one of the things they do not understand is the law of Moses and its purpose. Israel was a theocracy. And because Israel was a theocracy, they had an actual law that they had to live by. And there are things in the law of Moses that God was not endorsing or condoning. It was things that He was condemning. And there are things in the law of Moses that God is telling them how to deal with. And it's not because God is endorsing the same. It's because He was condemning those things. But a lot of times we as believers don't understand the difference between living under the law and living under grace. But there's a purpose statement for the law. And let's just jump down to verse 24 and let's capture it. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so we see several purpose words in the, in the Scripture. Uh, there's a word of inference. It means we can infer this. That, that's the word wherefore. And that's in verse 19 in the first word. In verse 24 we see the word uh, again. And it's, it's wherefore. And then the other one is a purpose word. And that is that. And you could say anytime you see that written this way in the Scripture, you could add two words of it to clarify in your mind. It's not necessary to add words as far as the Word of God goes. But you could say in order that. Uh, sometimes we use the word that in our English language differently than when it's being used for purpose, as it is here. But you could say, in order that, to help us to understand this is the reason why, or this is the purpose for it. Does that make sense to everybody here? Okay, so what's the purpose of the, uh, of the, of the law? Well, it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Many individuals are confused about works and requirements for a believer. Many individuals are confused because they think that keeping the law is a part of the gospel, or at least after you're saved that you ought to be able to keep the law. But the reality of it is it's that there has no flesh ever been justified by keeping the law. This never happened. Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5 really, really hammer that point home. Uh, Galatians in the entire book hammers that home. The purpose of the law is to show us that we're sinners. I appreciate the guys like uh, Ray Comfort and uh, what's the fellow that is on the movies uh, that hangs out with Ray? What? Kirk Cameron. Thank you guys. I'm sorry. I don't watch those movies and it's not because they're terrible. Well, to me, they are terrible. I just can't. I'm just, they're just not interesting to me. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm not trying to offend anybody. Go ahead and watch them. But one of the things I appreciate about those guys and their encountering and soul winning, I've watched it sometimes, I thought they're really good at talking to lost people and showing them that they need salvation. You ever seen 
they'll go stand on a crate or a soapbox or something and have a microphone and ask somebody that doesn't believe in God, hey, you guys want to debate or whatever. And they'll ask questions about God, but one of the things they'll do is they'll ask them questions about the law. They'll ask the person, are you a sinner? And the person will say, no, I'm not a sinner. And then they'll ask them things, have you ever lied, cheated, stolen, uh, lust? And they'll give them the scripture and show them, according to the word of God, you're a lying, cheating, murderer. And uh, that's uh, what God looks at you as. And that's a real help, isn't it? Now, one of the things where I would say I'm not endorsing them this morning because of is that because they're Calvinists, they don't, they don't finish preaching the gospel. They don't believe that God wants all men to be saved. And so they don't interfere with the person after they've, after they've showed them they're a sinner. They'll show them the gospel. Then they kind of walk away like, well, you know, God's going to sovereignly save them. Uh, if just, just depending. Most of the people, and again, don't get mad at me about this this morning, but most of the people who are their converts are church members that they've convinced are lost because of sin in their life. And that's, that's kind of where they deviate doctrinally because of their understanding of the law and grace. Now, again, I'm not, that, that's not what the message is about this morning. I just want to be careful about mentioning somebody and, and it's sounding as though it's an endorsement. I do not endorse uh, their plan of salvation because salvation for them is not simply faith in Jesus Christ. They would say you have to make Jesus Lord of your life. My friend, Jesus is Lord whether you make Him Lord of your life or not. Uh, Jesus is, or salvation is simply by faith. Victory is through Christ Jesus and by the help of God's Holy Spirit. And you do not, you know, people play semantical games with repentance and say, well, repentance is repenting of sin. Well, repentance is everything. I agree with any statement you make about repentance until you tell me that salvation is by repentance. It's not. It's by faith. And faith, my friend, involves repentance. You cannot believe in Jesus without repenting of anything. So if you want to make repentance about sin, my friend, you've limited repentance. It's too small of a scope. Repentance is everything other than Jesus. Uh, and you could say it's all sin, sure. But uh, you, you are redefining the gospel in a way that is absolutely wholly unnecessary because salvation is faith in Jesus. When a person looks to Jesus and says, I want to be saved, he's repented. He's repented. And you say, well, repentance... Well, anyway, I don't want to preach about that this morning. It's not what the message is about this morning, but it's important for us to, to get this. And what we want to understand about the law here is that it is a schoolmaster. What's a schoolmaster? Well, it's a teacher, and the purpose of the law is to bring us to our need of Christ. And so I'll urge you when you share the gospel, it is an important aspect of the gospel to let people know that, that not only are they sinners, but that Jesus died for sin. Now, honestly, the debate about sinners is not one we often have. Most people are putting you off when they try to say they don't sin. Uh, now, some people honestly think they're good persons. Um, I remember before I was saved, I thought I was a good person. I remember that. I can relate to it. But uh, the facts didn't bear out with the reality of what I actually was. I'm not a good person. And so the law is a good a schoolmaster to say, here's the law, have you kept the law? No, you haven't kept the law, so you're not a good person, and so you need Jesus Christ. Okay, now it's important then, because John simplifies the gospel. John's gospel, actually I should say, John accounts Jesus simplifying the gospel a great deal. So it's important for us to understand the contrast between the law and the gospel. Will you go back to John chapter 1 again, please? Okay. The Bible says in verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, this is not an aberration in, in Jesus' ministry. Jesus had a lot to say about the law in His ministry. One of the things, if you read the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus said, was that I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law. In other words, he's the only individual who has ever walked on this earth who has never sinned, who has kept every every single aspect of his law. Not man's law, his law and God's law and the law that God gave to Moses. Jesus complied with it in every point. There's no way, no area where you could point out uh, that Jesus Christ has broken the law. It's interesting, it's uh, hypocritical, but interesting that the Pharisees and the religious rulers of the day oftentimes accused Jesus of things. But it's fascinating that they never could outright accuse Him Himself of breaking the law. They would always talk about other people. Remember they talk about the disciples. They've eaten on the Sabbath day. The disciples have eaten with unwashing hands. And they would say that about them. They would say about Jesus, you eat with publicans and with sinners and you receive them. 
Well, where in the law does it say that Jesus, thou shalt not eat with publicans and sinners? Now, there's things the Bible says uh, in the law about how to, to behave toward a Gentile, but Jesus never broke the law. The closest thing they could accuse Jesus of was loving transgressors. You find for me in the law of Moses that we're to hate transgressors. Find for me that rule, that law. And so they could always come up with man-made concepts of that, that made assumptions like this. The assumption is I keep the law and therefore I'm too good for the lawless. The only person who is too good for sinners is whom? Who's the only person who's too good for sinners? Jesus. God is, right? What is the reason why uh, we are separated from God? What is that thing specifically that separates us from God? It's our sin. And it is ironic and ridiculous that the very individuals who only could pretend to keep the law would have the audacity to accuse the only person uh, for whom sin separated them from the law of being a sinner. It's amazing. Uh, it's actually incredible, the audacity of it. And uh, John gives us a gospel of account of a Savior who did not come to destroy the law, uh, but he gives us a contrast of a Savior to Moses who gave a law for sinners, but he came not to give the law, but he came to give grace and truth. This should put in context for you when Jesus is asked by the Pharisees in Matthew, for instance, and in Mark and in Luke about the matter of divorce. Remember that when they come to Jesus and they're, they're tempting Him, they're questioning Him, and they're asking Him, what about divorce? Uh, you know, is it okay or is it not okay? And they knew, they thought they knew that they had Him because the law gave provisions for how to do divorce. But what did Jesus say? Moses gave it because of the hardness of your heart, but it was not so from the beginning. God said that marriage is what? A man and a woman are joined to this, they're to his, man's joined to his wife, and those two are going to be one flesh. And Jesus just simply said, well, if God have uh, joined together, let not man put asunder. My friend, Moses' law may talk about things that have to do with sinners and what to do with sinners. But Moses' law uh, doesn't deal with perfection. doesn't deal with keeping the law. So why did Jesus not come to give us a law? We already had a law, right? Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to die for sinners. And John right away is helping us to understand the purpose of Jesus' coming was not to correct the world. The purpose of Jesus' coming was actually to be the sacrifice for a world which could not be corrected or could not keep the law. Jesus came to die for sinners. And we're already seeing that in verse 7. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus say Moses wrote it in the law? When he's talking about uh, particularly the matter of divorce. Because of the hardness of your heart. Did Jesus come because of the hardness of our hearts? He did? Jesus came because of the heart? No, He came to save sinners. So a hard-hearted person can't be saved. They can't receive Jesus. They will not receive Jesus. You have got to quit. I'm telling you. This is going to be trouble later. Alright? Now, verse 18. Jesus goes on to say next thing. No man has seen God at any time. Who's seen God? No man has seen God at any time. Now this is where people would say, Ah, oh, but, 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 but Moses. Do you remember Moses seeing God? Well, there's some real help here uh, for us. So let's go, let's go look at, at Moses' experience uh, with God. Will you please go with me back to Genesis in chapter 32? Genesis in chapter 32. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten of the Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And so I want to just look at something important because this points us to another verse or reference of Scripture that has to do with, with the simplicity of salvation. Okay? No man has seen God at any time. Genesis chapter 32. And will you please look down to verse... Well, I'm in Genesis chapter 3. That's why it's not working right. Um, we're going to look at verse 30. But before that, I want to look at verse 25 and read down to verse 30. Uh, we know the story of Jacob. This is when he becomes Israel and he wrestles with the angel. Uh, the Bible says, When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. 
as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jacob indeed see God face to face? No. Well, actually, uh, uh, no, he actually did. You say, but I've seen God face to face. Okay, what does the Bible call the individual that Jacob wrestled with? He's called a man. He wrestled with a man. Yeah, he's called a man there. And so he wrestled with a man. Now, now, who was the angel of the Lord in this instance? Who's able? Are angels able to bless people? No. We'll, we'll start praying to them, right? No. Shall we? Uh, no, Jesus. Yeah, this is Jesus that's here uh, in, in the form of a man. But it is Jesus in the same form in which he was when he came to this earth, and that is that he has laid aside his glory as God. Now, he's not a sinner. He's not a sinful man. Let me just ask you another practical question. How well would a man do wrestling with God? <laughs> Not a chance. Do you understand when the Bible says that he wrestled with an angel? The obvious implica implication here is that this is God that, that Jacob is wrestling with. And you understand, Jacob didn't pen Jesus. That sounds blasphemous, but I want to, I want to state it that way so you kind of understand the context here. In other words, this is not God in His glory, is it? Was Jesus in His glory when He came to this earth? I love the way the Scripture says when it, the Bible tells us He hath no form or comeliness, and we see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. Do you think God has form or comeliness? Think, do you think God is? You think you could say describe God in heaven as anything uh, not beautiful? Anything? I mean, beauty. What what makes beauty? Well, perfection actually does, right? When you see someone and you're like, that's about as perfect as that person could be, and you think they're beautiful because of it, uh, it's because everything is the way it should be. Uh, I've seen some things that are difficult to look at. Sometimes people post the you know, send us money pictures on social media. You know what I'm talking about? You know, they send you a picture of some something or somebody that's that is a deformity or. Uh, sometimes I don't know if it's real or if it's not, but it's, uh, you know, this terrible thing happened, send us money. Do you all have Pakistani um, and uh, uh, Indian and Hindu and all those friends on Facebook like I do? And, and the, the, all the people from all the places in Africa? I do. I've been trying to eliminate 500 friends a week on Facebook that I don't know, but I've got a lot of people I don't know. And they send me messages with just horrific pictures of things. And I think some of them are real, but some of them also are like, send us money. We have something terrible uh, because of it. Listen, this is not Jesus. This is not what the Bible's saying about Jesus. But Jesus did not come in beauty. He did not come in glory. He came as a man in a very, very relatable way. And as Jacob is wrestling with the man, we know he's wrestling with the angel until the break of day, right? But we know that this is not God in His glory, and that's the difference. Uh, let's, let's look at the contrast then, uh, shall we, uh, with, um, with uh, well, let's go to chapter 33. Uh, it's just one verse over. And um, this is uh, Shalem. That's not where I want to be. I think it's Exodus. Oh, let's go to Exodus. Yeah, it's Exodus chapter 33. Chapter 33, verse 11 um, is about Jacob again, but we don't have time to look at that. Let's go to Exodus chapter 33. Hopefully my Bible says what it's supposed to here. Alright, I want to look at verse 11. This is about Moses. Now the Bible says, The Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his son, servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And so this is... Um, and then go down with me at, to verse 20. Same context. I'll actually look at verse 18. This is when God tells Moses, ask anything, I'll do it for you. Uh, he, he says, you found grace in my sight. Verse 18. He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all thy goodness, all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, verse 20, thou canst not see my face, 
For there shall no man see me and live. Now, did you read verse 20 with me? Mm -hmm. Let's go back and read verse 11 again. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Okay, let me ask you a question. Did Moses, when the Holy Spirit was using him to perfectly pen the Word of God here, did he forget what he'd written, you know, a half a paragraph before? No. Was Moses confused here? I saw God face to face. Can't see God face to face. And he forgot it. Was it like... Uh, like uh, and, and you know, Charlie's talking about Islam this morning. Was it like when um, the three daughters of Allah, you know, the triune Allah God, the God of the moon, the sun, and the earth, when when uh, Quran, you know, he wrote in the Quran, ah, oh, you know, uh, God, Allah's only one God, and then he corrected it by saying, oh, there's three gods, and then uh, he uh, corrected it again and he wrote, well, or he didn't write; it was written for him. Satan made me write that in God's word, supposedly. That and so that isn't true. There's only one God Allah. Is that what we have here in the Bible? No, what we have here in the Bible, anytime there is a seeming contradiction, is for us to stop, to pause, and say what's being taught here. There's no there are no contradictions in the scripture. But every time you see something, it's made to say, okay, wait a second. So when I'm reading along in a chapter and I read, you know, I see saw God face to face, and a few verses later, no man can see God's face and live, then all of a sudden I'm saying, Okay, now why did God put this in his word this way? What's well, so I can understand something? And if we understand it, we'll be done here this morning. So let's see if we can see if we can make it happen. Uh, in verse 23, uh, God told Moses, "I will take away my hand; thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen." So the question is, did Moses ever see God face to face? No. No. In other words, when God speaks like a man, God speaks face to face. But when God speaks in His glory, the children of Israel said, "Moses, you go and talk to God for us." Because we cannot be... He's too terrible for us. If we see His glory, we would not live. And that's, that's another sermon for another day. Go back to John chapter 3, will you please? And here we're going to see a key theme in the Gospel of John from what we, we see. And this is in verse 18 when the Bible says, uh, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Now why would it be that John in his gospel showing us who Jesus is wants to help us to know that no man's ever seen God. Why is that important? If you think about how terse and how fast the gospel of John moves along. You ever notice? You know in Luke, you know we in Matthew we start with the genealogies when we get into the gospel, right? You know, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares, and Zerah, Tamar, and Phares begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nassan, and Nassan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat... And you go on and on and on, and it takes, and then you get to uh, the story of, of uh, who Mary is, and then you see the, the story of John the Baptist. We're just told, John the Baptist... John spoke con concerning him. Now, of course, we know that's because uh, the Apostle John knew that the other Gospels were already written. But again, this is a very, very terse Gospel. There are not wasted words in this Gospel. Yet it would be, uh, with the exception of Mark, it would be the shortest of the Gospels and certainly the most simply and quickly read and understood. So then that begs the question, out of all the things John has time to help us to say or to know in order to tell us who Jesus is and how we can believe in Him, why does He tell us no man has seen God face to face? Well, because it's important for us to understand, my friend, that without Jesus there's no access to God. Mm. Amen. This is our point today. It's what we got to get to. It's important for us to understand that without Jesus there is no access to God. Jesus we will find in John is a very, very exclusive door to God. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And what John wants us to know is what Jesus told Nicodemus. Turn over a page or so in your Bible to chapter 3. In verse 13... John is careful to record what Jesus told Nicodemus when he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, 
which is in heaven. Sometime get literal with someone as you're preaching the gospel. It'll help you. Sometime when you're preaching the gospel with someone, make sure to get literal with them. What do you mean by that? Do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? How many people think they're going to heaven when they die? Throw out a number. Most. Most. Right? Okay, he says 80. I'm going to say 90. 90% 90 of people or more, I think, uh, believe they're going to go to heaven when they die. But when you get literal with them, that's where it breaks down. What are you taking with you? Now we know the old analogies everybody's heard about. You know, you never see a hearse behind a, um, or you never see a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse. And so I actually know someone. There are probably a lot of people done, but I actually had him uh, pull a, a U-Haul trailer behind his hearse as a joke uh, when he died. And I don't know how much he enjoyed his joke at that point, but he did do it. Uh, so, uh, but the reality of it is, what are you packing? What are you taking with you when you go to heaven? That's a pretty good literal question, isn't it? What are you going to take with you? Well, we know there's eternal rewards. We know we can take people that are eternal with us to heaven. But when we get literal about it, um, you know, we can ask the question, what are you taking with you? What are you going to wear on your trip? What are you going to wear? Are you going to dress cold or warm? What are you going to wear when you go to heaven? Get, get more literal. Uh, where is heaven? Where is it where, God's, where Jesus Christ is preparing mansions? Where is that? Are, there obviously aren't GPS coordinates for it, but do you have some kind of trajectory that you're taking? You know, if heaven is in a particular actual place, and it is, you need to leave at the right time or you'll head off the wrong way, won't you? Can you imagine if the, you know, the, the uh, astronauts, when they went to the moon, left at the wrong time of day? They'd have gone the opposite direction, wouldn't they? You know, you, you, if heaven's a literal place, you got to literally know how to get there. And here's the question. What mode of transportation will you be taking? Will you be taking bus? Will you be taking airplane? Will you be taking rocket ship? What mode of transportation will you be taking? And uh, will Elon Musk be part of that? <laughs> Are you the guy that's going to pay a billion dollars for a trip to the moon? Like there's a guy in Japan that paid him a billion dollars for a trip to the moon. Uh, how are you going to get to heaven? Literally, how are you going to get there? You know, most people never think about it in those terms, do they? Friend, listen to me. You don't even know where heaven is. How in the world do you think you're going to get there? That's what John's trying to explain here. No man has seen God at any time. John is here in saying, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a clue how to know God. No man's seen God face to face, John says. Now, is he saying no, but no person's ever encountered God? No person's ever seen the glory of God? Moses saw the glory of God, didn't he? At least from the reflection of it in the, in the cleft of the rock. What is John here trying to say? Well, he's saying the same thing uh, that Jesus said when he said, No man hath ascended up to heaven but the Son of Man, which is come down, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And what John wants us to understand, my friend, is the exclusivity of the gospel. That is, this is not a multiple modes entry. You can't take a different way of transportation. You ever been in a church that had transportation Sunday? You know, everybody comes different ways. Some folks walk. I've seen people come in on a unicycle. Some people ride in on an antique car. Some people come on, on a horseback. I want to get one of those little hovercrafts come in on a little, you know, one of these uh, drones, a man-made drone, and uh, come in on a drone to church sometime. But the fact of the matter is when it comes to getting to heaven, Jesus, Jesus is the only means. This is precisely what he was telling Nicodemus. And it's precisely what John is trying to help us to know when he said, no man has seen God face to face. One, God is so holy that you cannot face Him and live. Two, because no man has seen God face to face, you must be born again, just like Nicodemus said, or you must have Jesus in order to see God. In other words, John in his gospel is trying to help us to understand that in order to see God, you must know Jesus Christ. And so, uh, if you would like to look at uh, references, uh, I realize now we're, we're past the time we, we want to be, but let me read to you Psalm chapter 68 and a couple of verses about God. Uh, Psalm chapter 68, and look down at verse uh, 18. Thou hast ascended on high, 
thou hast led captivity captive, for thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. When we talk about Jesus Christ ascending and descending, we're also talking as well about the reality that Jesus went into paradise and led captivity captive. That's what's referred to in Ephesians chapter 4. By the way, this is not teaching the false doctrine that Jesus literally uh, went to hell. Jesus had God turn His back on His Son. Jesus did not go to hell. He ascended. Verse uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, Wherefore He saith, it's referring to Psalm 68, When He ascended up on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That's a reference to Psalm 68. And it's when Jesus went into paradise, and we see it in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 27, after Jesus came, or after after Jesus uh, died on the cross, then, then there was a great earthquake, and the saints came up out of the graves. That's when Jesus led captivity captive. See, in that time, in that day, to be absent from the body was not to be present with the Lord, because no man was able to see God face to face until the f final work of the cross was completed. That is, until the death of Jesus Christ, which breaks down the barrier of separation between man and God. And so, in verse 9, now he ascended, what is it, but that he also descended, first in the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. And the statement in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10 is that he might fill all things. And my friend, that brings us to a, to a place where we could conclude this morning by looking at John chapter 1 verse 18 and saying, no man has seen God at any time. We can look at John 3 and uh, we could see Jesus saying, no man uh, hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down to heaven. And we could see from this gospel of what John is showing us by the help of the Holy Spirit about Jesus is that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. He's the only one who knows where it is. He's the only one who can get there. And the only way you or I will get there will be through the mode of transportation. That is that Jesus Himself takes us there. Jesus gets us there. And so if you were to reverse the question and say to me, well, Pastor, you've asked me what my mode of transportation is going to be. What's yours? Jesus. Jesus is taking me there. If I... If I live, if I tarry till the Lord Jesus comes, I'm going to see Him in the sky and He's going to say, come up hither. And He's going to take me there. Of those individuals that sleep in Jesus whose bodies are in the grave but whose souls are present with the Lord, their bodies are going to be told, come up hither. And He's going to resurrect them and they're going up. That's going to be the mode of transportation. And so here we see in the Gospel of John, we see Jesus Christ presented as the only way for eternal life because He's the only one that can get to heaven. He's the only one that knows where it is. And there's no other way but Jesus Christ. And it's an important theme and we'll see it throughout as we preach through the Gospel of John. And I hope it's a help to you today. I, I, sometimes I feel badly when I throw verses at people and the verses are so full of doctrine by themselves that it's like oh, I feel like I ought to mention or preach that and you can't get sidetracked too much that way. But the reality of it is, friend, is I want us to understand just as simply as we possibly can that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. You can say, well, I, you know what, I have an alternative religion. Well, that alternative religion will give you rules for how you live in this life, but it doesn't have any way to get you to heaven. It doesn't have anything to do with it. There's no other gospel that answers the question of how you're going to get to Jesus, how you're going to get to God. Just no gospel tells you how you're going to get to God. And not with a satisfactory answer. You know the best answer I can give? <laughs> Jesus knows, and He's going to do it. Jesus has been to heaven. He came from heaven. He's gone to heaven. And when He comes for me, my friend, He'll know how to get there. And He'll take me. And I won't get there because of anything I've done. I'll get there because of what He did. And that's that He died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and He rose again. And I'm risen with Him. Friend, isn't a wonderful thing to be able to just relax? To be able to rest? Not in what we do, but in what Jesus has done. And that's the ultimate application of the truth we've seen here this morning. Now God, I just pray that You would help us as we understand this doctrine, this Bible truth, that no man's ascended to heaven. No man's seen God face to face. And as we see this simple truth, may we come to the conclusion 
that the only way to know God is through Jesus. And the only way to get to heaven is by you taking us there because of knowing Jesus. Now, God, I just pray uh, that if there would be a person here in this room today that does not know Jesus as their Savior. God, I pray that the, the, the loving truth of the fact that Jesus, who was God, came to earth, not in His glory, but He came as a man and never sinned. God, I pray that impress hearts, impress people, to know that God loves them and that Jesus died for their sin. God, I pray that if there are believers here, God, that sometimes get confused about religion and get confused about what it is necessary in order for us to be saved or to be able to uh, know that we have eternal life and assurance of salvation. God, I pray that the simplicity of the reality that Jesus is the only way, the exclusive way to heaven would impress us so we'd be able to rest in that truth. Now, before I finish my prayer here this morning, I'd like to ask every person to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed because we're going to have a time of invitation in our service this morning. The invitation it will be a time when we invite you just to respond to whatever God said in your, to you, specifically whatever truth God showed you from His Word this morning. It may be this morning that the truth that you've been shown is that you're looking to something other than Jesus to get to heaven. And you realize that you don't know where heaven is and you certainly don't know how to get there. If that would be you and you're here this morning, you'd say, Pastor Price, I'm not sure I have all the answers yet, but one of the things I know is that Jesus is the only one who's come from heaven and who can get me to heaven. And I don't know that uh, Jesus is my Savior. I don't know that confidently. If that's you, just slip up your hand. I won't call you out or embarrass you. But you say, pray for me because God's dealing with me about the matter of getting to where God is, to seeing God face to face. And I can't do it without Jesus. And I know that this morning. Just slip your hand up. Okay, here's the second question this morning. You're a believer. Sometimes as believers, we tend to forget that we're not saved because we kept the law. The law was just a schoolmaster that showed us that we needed Jesus. But you're a believer and you've gotten a little confused about that. And you've uh, forgotten the purpose of the law and that Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law, but God showed you the simplicity of it only being through Jesus, salvation being through Jesus Christ, as well as our, our being kept in Christ Jesus is through the work of God. Would you this morning, would you let God just deal with you about the matter of resting in the work of the cross, resting in what Christ alone can do? Sometimes we put so much on ourselves that is a burden that it's impossible for us to bear. If that's you and you're here this morning, you just slip your hand and say, Pastor, God's dealing with me about resting not in what I've done, but resting in what Christ has done. And I want to trust God with that here this morning. Slip your hand up, slip it right back down. Yep, slip up right back down. See that? All right, we're going to have a time of invitation. So, Father, we ask that you would bless and that you, you would just uh, help this time of invitation be one in which we say, Yes, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've asked Andrew to come up and sing uh, page 254, or you could sing along with him. It's... Uh, uh, page 254 in your blue hymn books. Andrew, would you come? And now we're going to just uh, sing all the verses of Come to the Savior, three verses. And if God's spoken to your heart, it would be just fine for you, we, instead of standing and singing in the invitation, to remain seated. And uh, while we sing Come to the Savior, make no delay, uh, you just respond to God as He's spoken to you. Will you please stand uh, if you're physically able to? And uh, we'll sing page 254, Come to the Savior. <laughs> 